sure. <clears throat> so my sound is coming through okay still? Um, yes, they are okay. good. Well, yeah, thanks very much for the, for the invitation and, and the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'll try and cover uh, some of my work uh, looking at coastal flows. Um, and as Anubhav mentioned, uh, this will be based on some of my PhD work. And then uh, towards the end, I'll, I'll show the, uh, how we've extended this uh, recently and, and the work we're doing now in my group um, at UW-Madison. Um, so um, a lot of this is <clears throat> motivated by coastal erosion processes, and in particular, coastal erosion of uh, beaches. Um, so this is kind of a global view of, of, uh, of some of the motivation and, and, and the problem. Um, if you look around the coastlines of the world, you know, roughly 50% of that coastline is some kind of sandy uh, or uh, uh, coarser beach. Um, and of those beaches, there are, you know, some that are facing erosion, some that are building up, but um, the eroding beaches tend to be a, a big, big problem because um, beaches, in fact, are, you know, very good at providing a natural barrier to any kind of storm induced flooding uh, from waves. Um, so they're very good at dissipating that wave energy. Um, but of course, the waves also shape the beach. And in many cases, there's a lot of erosion and, and that can be uh, expensive to remedy. Usually what's done in cases where, um, you know, there's no choice but to keep the beach uh, uh, at its current levels is, you, you know, you end up nourishing that beach with, with uh, sand mined offshore from other places. And that can be quite an expensive process. Um, the, one of the issues related to this is that it's not so easy to predict um, the rate at which sediment will be transported um, offshore or onshore. Right? So it's not so easy to predict exactly uh, what rate um, beaches will erode. It's quite a dynamic process. You know, it uh, is influenced by timescales of individual waves to, to over you know, years and decades. Um, but that process is, is, in general, a little bit less understood. So this is kind of our motivation. Um, so we can kind of zoom in on a, <clears throat> on a particular uh, uh, beach or, or sort of a schematic of a beach and look at all the kind of different areas and processes that might be going on. Um, so in typical beach system, you have some kind of wave forcing coming in. You may have a bar, um, but at some point due to reduced depth, the waves will break. Um, and then, you know, where, roughly where the waves break, we would call that from there onwards sort of a, a surf zone uh, with analogy uh, to surfing. And then there's the, there are these broken waves, uh, often called turbulent bores, that will continue to travel on shore and at some point reach the shoreline where they drive this sort of shallow flow up and down um, known as, you know, the swash. So this is the area of our focus. Um, because in this region, uh, the flow is really not well understood. Um, and in particular, you know, we know that a lot of sediment transport happens in this sort of region, but we don't know how to really connect it to the dynamics that are a little bit more well understood um, out in the surf zone here. So um, as I kind of advertise in the title, the, the, the purpose here is to try and understand the flow in this area and try and link it to some of the properties of the incoming waves coming in. Um, so if you go to the beach and you kind of uh, look at this area, this is what it looks like. So of course, quite different to uh, regular waves that you might see further out. What you see here is a quite a very, quite a shallow flow that moves up and down on the beach in, in a regular fashion forced by these uh, turbulent bores. And so what we'd like to try and understand is that um, we'd like to understand something about the flow depths and flow velocities related to this kind of swash flow. And in particular, if we care about sediment transport, we'd really like to understand the mechanisms behind uh, that process. Um, so the first order uh, guess at the most important uh, variable related to this is going to be the friction with the bed, right? The bed shear stress between the flow and the sediment is going to um, be the most important variable for predicting sediment transport. And indeed, you know, a lot of the numerical models that try and do this type of prediction will have some parameterization from the bed, off the bed shear stress from which they try and then compute sediment transport. Um, 
Okay, so that's kind of the overall goal um, uh, of this kind of research. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll sort of break it up into a few different pieces. Um, and I'll start with actually trying to measure the spec shear stress, right? So we, we did some experiments um, in, in wave tanks to try and understand the process of the swash zone. But our first challenge was to measure uh, the bed shear stress. And to do that, um, we built a little device. Um, so I'm gonna take a little break from the main problem just to tell you about this problem of measuring uh, the wall shear stress. <clears throat> okay, so in general, we know that the wall shear stress in, in uh, these kinds of flows relates to the gradient of the flow velocity right near the bed. Um, but in general, it's not so easy to resolve that uh, that boundary layer, in particular the gradient at the bed. So there are a number of techniques to try and um, infer the bed shear stress from various different other measurements. Um, and I've grouped these into some indirect methods and, and a direct method. Um, and in indirect methods, there are multiple different types, but you know you can measure the pressure uh, very close to the bed and then try and build some correlation function that tells you how this stagnation pressure related to the static pressure might, might relate to uh, the friction and the velocity gradient here. Um, another very standard way is to try and measure the velocity profile here. And even if you can't get measurements very close to the bed, in a lot of boundary layers that are turbulent, um, there's usually a logarithmic region uh, and you can fit a line to that logarithmic region which scales with the, with the bed shear stress, um, noted here as U tau. Um, there are also other techniques where you can have hot films and you try and correlate the heat flux away from this hot film uh, and how that uh, correlate that, that heat flux to the bed shear stress. Um, so uh, these, these, these techniques all have their advantages and disadvantages, um, but in all cases, you're, you're, you use, you're measuring something else and then inferring the bed shear stress. The, the other option is to build a sensor that will directly have some mechanical deflection related to uh, the friction imparted over a small piece of the bed, right? So here we have a small mechanical device which will experience stress on this surface, uh, experience a deflection as a consequence of that stress, and we can measure that deflection and knowing the stiffness of this mechanism, uh, calculate the bed shear stress directly. And so this kind of uh, direct, uh, direct method, you know, goes by a few different names. I'm calling it a shear plate sensor here. Uh, in aerodynamics, it's often called a floating element sensor. Um, and it's generally uh, quite successful as long as your pressure gradients are mild uh, in the streamwise direction, right? And the important part there is that um, because you have some edge here, if there's a gradient in pressure <clears throat> in the flow, you'll get an extra force on this edge uh, and that will contaminate the measurement uh, of, the, of the friction. Um, so um, this is usually not a problem in a lot of the um, aerodynamic type applications uh, where floating element sensors were typically historically used um, because the pressure gradients tend to be relatively mild uh, in a lot of those applications. In our case, we have free surface flows. And so even for a mild free surface uh, slope, you'll get quite large pressure gradients relative to the shear stresses. And so correcting for this edge force due to the pressure gradient is, is quite important. And so we developed a little method to do that um, where you want to calculate the bed shear stress experience over the surface. Uh, but what you measure is the total force on this, on this body, uh, F. And so if you know the pressure gradients uh, in the external flow, and we know them from measurements, uh, simultaneous measurements along with this device, then you can correct for it just by calculating the, the body force related to those pressure gradients, related to the volume of the plate. Um, the tricky part comes that in, in, in uh, realizing that actually, because the flow will be changing relative to the free, free flow here, relative to the um, confined flow within this chamber, uh, the gradient of pressure experienced by this plate is not the same above and below uh, the plate. And so you have to introduce this correction factor of the pressure gradient in front of this, uh, in front of this uh, pressure gradient force to correct for it. Um, so our goal was to try and understand how we might predict that uh, correction factor. And that was the first step. Um, and we basically analyzed this 
uh, by saying that, okay, if we have a relatively small chamber, we can assume that the flow in this is going to be a lower Reynolds number flow relative to the high Reynolds number flows that we're measuring above because the flow is confined. Um, in that case, we can linearize this uh, equation of motion. And in that case, the pressure field can be computed uh, following a simplified formulation. So, you know, if you make this approximation, basically you're saying that the pressure field now is only a function of the, the geometry and not, not necessarily the function of the forcing of the flow, right? So you end up with a, a Laplace equation instead of a, a Poisson equation. Um, so you can compute for your given geometry, uh, you can compute um, what the pressure distribution will be for any unit pressure difference across the two gaps. And then you can check as a function of the geometry, how that correction um, changes as, uh, and the most important variable here is uh, the thickness to gap ratio. Right? So how thick the plate is relative to how big the gap is. Um, and so you can see, you know, so if there's a pressure difference of uh, one above the plate, that pressure difference quickly decays to zero below the plate. And so the effective force felt by the pressure the effective force of the pressure gradient felt by the plate will rapidly decay as the thickness to gap ratio increases. Um, okay, so so this is kind of a, something that was a rel relatively um, new and in some in a technology that's relatively old, where you know this uh, the contamination of the of the pressure force was known about for a long time, uh, but but usually ignored and assumed to be small. Um, but here we have a sort of a first order correction for that um, in, in cases where it can be important. Um, okay, so that's kind of a little side note uh, on the development of the sensor uh, and the data I'll show from the sensor. Um, and I guess, sorry, this is just to finish the story. Uh, you can validate this, uh, this method by, by computing the bed shear stress with a wave traveling over uh, the sensor. And you see that if you if you assume a pressure gradient uh, a correction factor of one, which is what what you might do naively, uh, you don't quite get the right uh, shear stress evolution as if you compute it with the uh, prediction made from this numerical solution. Right. So for our sensor, for the geometry of our sensor, this fraction is is about eighty percent, um, and that helps us correct for this pressure gradient force. Okay. So that was kind of our uh, side uh, bar looking at how to measure this quantity that's important for the flows that we're interested in. Um, but now we can go back uh, to looking at the swash flow and trying to understand uh, how to predict the quantities that are important for the flow on the speech um, and how they relate uh, to the properties of the incoming wave. Okay. So I'll describe in the over the next sort of 15 minutes or so some experimental results uh, where we try to understand this process. Um, and the basic setup of the experiments is that um, we generate a pulsed wave. So this is a solitary wave that's, that uh, satisfies the, the KDV equation, but, but, but uh, that's not so important here. The important fact is that we have a controlled wave input uh, that travels along uh, the wave tank and then encounters this solid impermeable beach. And so it goes through the process that, that other waves would where it grows in amplitude and the front of the wave steepens and eventually the wave breaks. And so, you know, this is the start of our surf zone here. And then eventually it drives this swash flow where there's a shallow flow going up and down. Um, and the reason we do the experiments in this way is that um, we have a controlled input of one single wave uh, and so we have a very uh, nice way of comparing the flow variables here, so namely the water depth, the velocity, and the bed shear stress, and how they relate to the incoming uh, wave parameters. And because we do it with this sort of pulsed wave, we, we, have, um, we have a sort of very nice comparison between, uh, between the two things. <clears throat> okay, so that's the main question here, right? So how do the flow variables relate to the incoming wave parameters? Um, so you can look at this. Uh, you, you can look at this problem in a dimensionless sense, and you realize that the main uh, controlling parameter for the interaction between this wave and this slope is going to be some relation of how long this wave is compared to how long of the distance the, on the beach it has to travel before before it before it breaks. Um, 
If you want to look at it another way, it's basically saying how steep the beach is relative to the steepness of the initial wave coming in. Um, so, you know, the, these, are, these are equivalent ways of saying the same thing. Uh, but in essence, we have a slope parameter. And here I'm showing that it compares the wavelength of the beach to this beach length that it travels. Um, Okay, so this has been uh, looked at before in the context of trying to understand how wave amplitudes grow when they encounter a beach. Um, and so we have this nice quantification of a slope parameter published by Stefan Grilli in 97. And that takes into account uh, the, the speech slope and then the wave height relative to the water depth that it travels in. Um, so in solitary waves, um, the wave height and the wavelength are, are linked. Um, and so you can relate the wavelength to this wave height uh, as the square root. Um, OK, so what's important here is that as this uh, slope parameter increases in value, we're seeing that the beach slope becomes steep relative to uh, the wave slope. Um, and so you can imagine in the extreme case where we have a very steep beach slope, um, let's say a wall, a 90 degree wall, then in that case, we expect the wave simply to bounce off and reflect. Um, and then as the beach slope decreases in its slope, um, the wave has more and more time to travel on the slope and evolve and break and drive this flow. Um, so um, the, the type of breaking that we observe will change as a function of this slope parameter. Um, and there are these standard uh, qualitative um, uh, regimes of wave breaking that, that are used in coastal engineering, and, and we can demarcate them using the slope parameter. And so as the slope parameter increases in our experiments, we're able to generate a combination of these surging breakers that don't really show the kind of classic tube that you experience uh, or that you see in, in a lot of breaking wave photos, um, but they still break and drive a flow. And then the plunging breakers, which are the sort of classic images you see of wave breakers, and then spilling breakers, which are more common, more out in the open ocean, uh, but also happen on the coast where the top of the wave starts breaking uh, as it travels onto, onto shallower depth. Right? So we have these different qualitative regimes of, of wave breaking. Um, okay, so that's uh, uh, the setup of the experiments. Um, and now uh, what I'll do is I'll, well, you know, we're focused on uh, measuring the flow in this region, which is initially dry. Uh, but then experiences this swash flow when this wave breaks and, and drives that flow. And so we have a number of different uh, measurements, measurement points uh, that, we, that we did. Um, and, but I'll, I'll kind of show these uh, two measurement locations in black and red in the data that I show. Um, but this is a kind of setup of the experiment. So you kind of get an understanding of how we're making these measurements. Um, we have an ultrasonic sensor that measures the local water depth. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, we have an acoustic uh, velocity, um, an acoustic velocimeter that measures the flow velocities um, in the shallow flow. So this is measuring at two centimeters above the bed. We have a bed pressure measurement, and then we have this uh, sensor that we built uh, and validated the, the shear plate sensor, where you know small deflections of this plate in this direction will uh, tell us um, the shear stress. Okay, uh, so then these experiments are in a fairly large facility. This was uh, done at Oregon State University in the large wave flume. So we have a, a water depth offshore of about 1.7 meters. And so we're able to generate a fairly high Reynolds number and through number flows. Um, so I'll show you a video of the experiment just to uh, give you a flavor of what this type of experiment looks like. So here we have a wave coming in. We're looking up the slope. It breaks, drives that swash flow and then the return flow comes back. And that is an entire run uh, of our experiment. And so we can get measurements at different locations by moving the instruments and repeating the wave conditions. Um, they're very, and these, these experiments are very repeatable. Um, and, uh, and then we can also vary the wave height, uh, which also varies the wavelength. And we get different regimes of uh, the slope parameter and hence different uh, breaker types. So that's kind of the overall uh, idea behind the experiments. <clears throat> okay, so let me show you what um, the typical data uh, in these types of experiments looks like. Um, so these are uh, spatial snapshots of the water depth uh, shown in the line here, and then the velocity shown in these arrows. And these are taken, you know, from the different measurement locations that we have. Um, 
And you can see that, you know, initially the flow is all moving up the slope and this is the edge of the water, the shoreline. Um, and so it's all moving up the slope. And at some point the flow keeps moving up, but uh, down here, the flow reverses direction and starts going back down. And then eventually all the flow is rushing back down and the water is draining back out uh, to the bulk. Uh, of, you know, back out to sea, essentially, uh, right? So, and you can see that, you know, we're getting fairly high velocities here uh, on the order of several meters per second. Um, and in water depths of roughly, you know, order 10 centimeters uh, uh, water depth. So, so these are very fast, fast and shallow flows. Um, and that's, you know, part of the reason why they mobilize so much sediment. You can also look at the data um, in a time series format. So if you, if you pick any one of these measurement locations and look at the time series, so these are two different measurement points uh, and two different time series, you see that the water initially uh, rises quite steeply and then slowly uh, decreases back down to zero as the water drains back out. And the velocity shows uh, the pattern that you'd expect. You know, Initially, when the water first arrives at any location, it's very fast. Um, and then eventually it goes through zero, becomes negative as the velocity switches direction and we're draining back out. Um, so what's interesting here is that um, across the different experiments we had, across the different breaker types and slope parameters, um, this pattern was always preserved. Um, and you know, other, other research in swash flow has also found that this is a very typical pattern of, uh, of swash flow dynamics. Um, and so the question became that, you know, could we understand the underlying pattern here uh, of what's going on? And could we predict things like the max, you know, the flow velocity, the water depths, um, that kind of thing. Um, so to do that, um, we go back to some uh, theory related to this problem. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, you know, we're dealing with flows that uh, in general uh, are shallow, meaning that the horizontal length scales of the flow tend to be uh, much larger than the vertical length scales, um, except for this uh, breaking that happens in a very steep uh, way in a localized uh, region of the, of the flow. And so uh, this suggests that we use kind of a depth average framework to analyze this problem, um, in, and, but including nonlinear effects of, the, of a jump. Um, and so this is what uh, exactly what the nonlinear shallow water equations are. Um, so there's a depth average description of the uh, flow, and this is the conservation of mass, and this is the conservation of momentum. Um, and and uh, this has been studied uh, for, for a number of decades and trying to understand this type of problem. So this is the problem we have, right, where we have a bore, uh, some kind of shock from a wave that's already broken. And that's now traveling towards the shoreline and it's going to at some point drive a flow in the swash here. And we'd like to understand something about that flow based on the properties of, the, of this wave or bore coming in. Um, okay, so um, these nonlinear shallow water equations um, can be analyzed using characteristic variables. So there are two characteristic variables, a forward moving characteristic and a backward moving characteristic, alpha and beta. And they relate to the velocities and the depths uh, and time uh, in this way. Um, and so uh, a number of papers, you know, quite classical papers now, um, have found that in this type of problem, uh, right, if you want to analyze what happens in, in for, for this bore as it travels towards this uh, point where the water depth becomes zero, um, you can analyze that situation by saying that uh, the forward moving characteristics in this, in this, uh, behind the shock will become a constant value um, as, they, as they approach this uh, point. And so this is the equation, you know, so this is basically how you might analyze that, right? So to say that the, uh, the, the uh, forward moving characteristics right behind this bore, so the velocity, the depth, um, are going to be constant and they, we'll, we'll call that constant capital us uh, for now to to see um, some links with the swatch flow in, in a bit um, okay uh, so that's the characteristic rule for predicting what happens to this bore as it approaches the shoreline um, and this is the kind of physical picture that it produces um, this is what's known as bore collapse in the literature um, so you have this jump uh, that's traveling towards the shoreline and in the very last stages, uh, before it reaches this point of zero water depth, 
the bore height starts to decrease as predicted by this characteristic group, and the velocity behind the bore, the fluid velocity here starts to increase. Um, and at some point, by the time you get here, the bore, bore height is totally collapsed to zero, and all the kinetic energy of the bore is, is converted into a, into all the potential energy of the bore is converted into a kinetic energy that drives this swash flow and this shoreline. And so um, we can say that, you know, the velocity with which this shoreline initially starts to move is related to uh, this constant value of the characteristic variable. And so that's what this variable us is supposed to represent, right? The starting velocity of this shoreline um, when this bore collapse occurs. Okay, so this is uh, some theory and some, you know, there have been some simulations that have uh, showed uh, the success of this theory, um, you know, many decades ago. Um, but, uh, but this hasn't been necessarily applied to experiments to try and understand how, how we can use this uh, to predict swash flow. And so, so that was that was part of our goal. Um, the another solution of the nonlinear shallow water equations that becomes relevant here is another classical solution known as the the dam break problem. Um, and in this case, we're working in a sloping coordinate system um, uh, because we're on a sloping beach. And if you imagine a situation where the water depth behind a dam on the sloping beach is constant, so this depth remains constant. And initially we say that the velocity of this uh, mass is zero. Then again, we can analyze the situation with the characteristic variables and you see that U equals zero at the beginning. C is a constant. So C is the water depth that's constant at T equals to zero. So initially um, uh, this entire char the characteristic variable over this entire domain is a constant. And let's call that constant again, US. And so, you know, since this is going to be governed by the motion of these characteristics, if initially the, the, the characteristic variable alpha is constant throughout this flow domain, it means that it remains constant as these characteristics travel forward. Um, and so this is a dam break problem, which again has a solution that's known. Um, and it produces this type of flow where you have this flow that, that uh, will, um, essentially it's kind of like a rarefaction wave where this shock collapses and you produce this flow that goes up. And because we're on a slope, it will, it will eventually come back down too. So this is again, a prototypical kind of a situation that we might expect for the swash flow. Um, but again, it hasn't been, hasn't been compared carefully with experiments to see whether this is a, a valid uh, model. Um, so here again, the velocity US is going to be the velocity with which this point initially travels upward. Um, and that, uh, that is the same as the constant uh, of the characteristics here. Okay, so now that we've covered some theory, let me sort of summarize it here. Um, if we say that T equals to zero is when this bore reaches the shoreline, then we have a theory that predicts what happens <clears throat> in terms of the characteristic variables for negative time. And we have a theory that has some relation to this kind of problem, but a different initial condition uh, but predicts what the flow flow will be doing at positive time when again uh, t equals to zero is the breaking breaking of the dam. Um, okay, uh, and in both cases the characteristic uh, forward moving characteristic alpha is supposed to be constant uh, behind this region and behind this region um, in the flow. And then if and so if we try and link these two different solutions together and and give it a common constant u s we you know we should in theory have um, have a complete kind of description of the of the problem we're considering. Uh, Nimish, may I ask one uh, question here? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So when uh, when you're looking at this uh, system using the shallow water equations, is there a way that these so S I'm guessing is the slope, right? S and, is the slope. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, is there uh, somewhere it appears that there is a, a critical slope at which this would happen? Because earlier you mentioned about the fact that the steepness matters, right? That mm -hmm. uh, at some point you would obviously not have this wash forming because it's too steep for it to climb. That's uh, right. Is that something which is uh, already included in the model here? In in the model here, it's not included because you assume, you know, to do, to kind of try and understand this bore collapse process, mm -hmm. you assume you already have a shock. Okay. And so, in real life, in the experiments, as we'll see in a few slides. <clears throat> 
Um, the question of whether this shock forms or not depends on the slope in the way that you described. Okay. Uh, but in the theory, you were assuming that the, the shock has already formed. And so by comparing, you know, I guess that's one of the advantages here. Um, in some sense, you know, we say that breaking waves are well described by the nonlinear shallow water equations. Uh, but then we have this slope parameter that predicts different types of breaking, which clearly relate to how shallow the flow really is. Mm -hmm. And so, so in the experiments, uh, you see this matching well with the theory versus not depending upon that slope parameter. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me with other questions if any, if anyone has any. Um, Okay, so, so we have these two sets of theories that we can use to analyze this situation. Um, and so now we can go to the experiments and see how well they work. And this is exactly what the question was just about. Um, so we have some measurements of this kind of situation, right? So we have some measurements of the bore height and the bore velocity just before it reaches the shoreline uh, from different measurements that we have. And so we can use the bore collapse theory to predict uh, so this P stands for prediction, predict what this constant will be using the Bohr collapse theory. And then we also have had a camera overhead looking on top of the flume that was able to, uh, was able to see the difference between the wet and the dry. And so when the wave breaks and starts to move the shoreline forward, we have a measurement of that initial shoreline velocity by tracking this, this interface. And so now we can test uh, the predictions of the theory against uh, the measurements from the experiments and compare that with uh, for different cases, uh, which we are analyzing in terms of the slope parameter. Right. Um, and so uh, uh, circles here are the predictions and uh, triangles here are the, the measurements. And we see that as the slope parameter decreases and we move into this plunging breaker regime we see that the predictions and uh, measurements start to match each other very, very well, right? And this makes sense in the context of the theory because it's only when we get to smaller slope parameters and plunging breakers that we really have this type of situation where we have a shock. And so we're matching uh, the assumptions of the theory. As we move towards surging breakers where the slope is effectively steeper compared to the wave, um, we see that the predictions predict, uh, so the theory predicts a higher higher uh, uh, initial shoreline velocity or that constant compared to, uh, compared to the experiments. And you can interpret that as, as, as sort of incomplete collapse, right? So um, in the experiments, because the wave doesn't un undergo the same type of violent breaking as it does in plunging breakers, the collapse process doesn't complete. Uh, and so you don't get the same velocity, uh, initial velocity that you would have predicted from, from, uh, from assuming that it was a shock. Right, so, so it's sort of like an incomplete collapse. Um, the other thing we can do is test the other side of the theory. So we have the dam break theory to try and understand the flow uh, during the swash process. And again, you know, we're, we're looking at the forward characteristic variable here and we have measurements of the velocities, the water depth, and we keep a track of time. And so we can go into these measurements and see whether the flow indeed satisfies a constant alpha type solution. Um, and so this is the data um, where you can see different types of waves. So these are uh, different wave, uh, different types of waves, basically waves of different amplitudes. Um, and I've averaged across the various different measurement locations. And I'm showing how this alpha quantity varies as a function of uh, time. And we see that it's not perfectly a constant, but there is a region, uh, the, you know, the bulk of the, the swash flow appears that across, you know, for any given wave, it's roughly a constant value. Um, and this value has this number, you know, which we can use to interpret what the flow is. Um, so we can test it against the theory more directly with that, uh, with that in mind. Um, and you see that the water depth evolution and the velocity evolution is really well predicted by this, by this dam break theory, right? Which makes sense, you know, so since we had a constant alpha flow before the swash was started, we expect that we would also have a constant alpha flow after the swash uh, started. Okay, so this is quite successful. Um, so this is a particular wave case that I'm showing. Um, but we can now go back to our uh, uh, parameter space and again, look at this in terms of the slope parameter. And now we have a third measurement to add to this, um, which is to calculate the constant here 
measured from within the swash flow and comparing that to the predictions and the measurement of the initial shoreline velocity. Um, so again, let's look at the plunging first, where we have good agreement between the predictions and the measurements. And here we see that actually, if you go into the flow and measure the value of that constant, you get a lower number uh, than the initial shoreline velocity that you measured. Um, and this we interpret basically as a loss of energy. So in the in the in the theory, um, all the kinetic and all the potential energy of the bore is converted into a kinetic energy um, of uh, the swash flow. But um, in the measurements, we're seeing that actually the swash flow is driven with a lower constant compared to the initial shoreline velocity. And you know, we think that that might be due to some loss of energy during the breaking process and in the process, uh, in the bore collapse process. On the other side, in the surging breaker regime, um, you see that the swash flow is actually driven with a higher constant uh, compared to both the predictions and the measurement of the initial shoreline velocity. Uh, and that again relates to this fact, this idea of incomplete collapse. Um, so even when you measure the sh shoreline velocity at the start in a surging breaker, that doesn't give you uh, the full energy with which the swash flow will be driven because the collapse process has not completed. And so when you go and measure the flow, you actually get a higher uh, constant with which the flow is driven. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, I'll take a pause here um, <clears throat> and then remind you that, you know, this entire uh, process was uh, first motivated by trying to understand what happens to the bed shear stress, uh, because that's an, an important parameter for sediment transport. And initially, we thought also an important parameter for how the flow evolves. Um, and so um, this has kind of been entirely missing from the story that I've been telling you for the last 10, 15 minutes, because we have essentially predicted how the flow evolves uh, without really considering uh, friction with the with the bottom uh, at all. Um, and so we now we can go back to these bed shear stress measurements and understand, you know, what role that really plays in in this swash flow. Um, so let's go back to these uh, snapshots of the data and look at what the what the bed shear stress measurements showed. Um, and so I'm looking at a, these, so, you know, these are two different uh, regimes, surging breakers and, and plunging breakers. And I'm showing snapshots uh, initially, pretty close to the start of the swash flow. And at the end, pretty close to the end of the swash flow when everything is flowing downwards in a very fast and shallow uh, flow. And what I wanna point out is that, you know, let's look at this example here. Here's where the shoreline is. Um, and we see that the bed shear stress is indeed very high near this, this moving point between the wet and the dry, but behind that, in the bulk of the flow, the bed shear stress is pretty small. And that's why we were able to successfully predict the flow here without looking, without really considering friction. Um, again, at the end of the swash where the velocities are very high and the flow depths are very shallow, it makes sense again that the bed shear stress is large and negative. So again, it's important towards the end of this swash cycle, right? So. Um, it's important near the start at the tip, and then it's important near the end um, uh, uh, throughout the domain uh, at the very end of the, of the cycle. Okay, um, so what that means, at least for the uprush, is that uh, we have a cartoon that looks a little bit like this. Um, we have a swash flow traveling up. Some of that flow might already be moving down. Um, but if I want to sketch what the shear stress looks like um, on top of this snapshot, I see that it's really high near this tip where we have you know, high fluid momentum being injected right close to the bed, and then pretty, pretty small throughout the main domain, and then starting to become negative and important again towards the, the bottom here. So you know, we know that the flow evolution in the bulk here was well predicted, ignoring the friction. And so what that suggested to us was that we look at this maximum value right at the tip and try and understand what's going on with that maximum value. <clears throat> and so I'm plotting here uh, the maximum value at different space, uh, different measurement locations for all the different types of wave conditions we had. And in general, you see that there's a fair bit of scatter in this data. Um, but now we know something about this flow. We know that the most important scale in this flow is going to be US, uh, that initial shoreline velocity. And so we tried to parameterize this maximum value of the bed shear stress in terms of this, uh, in terms of that uh, important scale 
and we find a reasonably good collapse across the scattered data, right? So it's not perfect, but it shows you that if you normalize the maximum bed shear stress with this scale, and then normalize distance with respect to the run-up, the run-up is the maximum distance that the water reaches, uh, across all different types of wave conditions, you see a reasonably uh, reasonably okay collapse, uh, showing you again that the that this uh, scale is important uh, in the flow. Okay, um, so let's go back to this picture now again that we started with um, and try and understand you know what role this friction will play. So we know that the friction is mainly important near this tip, and we have some way of predicting uh, what its value will be. Uh, based on you know this scale that we have uh, the the initial shoreline velocity, and so we try to construct a model of how the tip of this flow moves up, uh, because what the friction is going to do is it's going to reduce the maximum distance that this travels. Uh, it's going to reduce the run up, as they as they say in coastal engineering. Um, so we can try and construct a model of this situation where we say, okay, let's treat this tip of the flow as some bulk uh, fluid body that's allowed to exchange mass and momentum with the flow behind. But this tip is going to be affected by friction and I'm going to parameterize that with in, in the way that I showed in the previous slide. Um, so this is borrowing some ideas from a classical paper by, uh, by Witham. Um, and, and, we can, and we can write down the conservation of mass for this tip, which is allowed to exchange mass and momentum with the bulk flow. And again, the conservation of momentum. The nice thing here now is that we have a successful model for, for the bulk flow, right? That was the dam break flow we, uh, we were able to use to, to predict this flow evolution behind the tip. So now, because we know this, we have a good analytical model for these quantities, we can solve for the, uh, for the tip flow here. So you basically have to rearrange this equation and solve for this uh, velocity of the tip and from that, you can calculate the position of the, of the tip A. So I won't go over those details. Um, they're they're, they're in, the, in the citation here. But now you can predict what the shoreline position and velocity will be with that model. And so if there is no friction, the shoreline moves in a parabolic way um, because it just moves ballistically. And the velocity decays with time uh, linearly just because of gravitational deceleration. Um, but if you add friction using the model I just showed, you can predict that the uh, shoreline uh, motion and the run-up will be reduced due to the friction, and the shoreline velocity will be um, will decay faster, especially near the start, um, uh, relative to the frictionless case. So we can again use this model, compare it against the different data we have. Here I'm only choosing the plunging breakers. Um, because they satisfy um, the flow model much better, right? The collapse was more complete in that case. Um, and we see that near the start of the swash cycle, we're able to predict the velocity decay fairly well. Um, and, then, and then the data does something uh, more complicated than the model. Um, but because we capture this initial deceleration well, when you integrate it, you do a reasonably good job at predicting the, the position. Um, and, and so this model, in this case at least, gives you a good upper bound, a much better upper bound than the frictionless case for the maximum run-up that the, that the data show. Um, so this is sort of a nice way to try and understand how much run-up reduction you get uh, because of friction at the tip uh, of, the, of the swash. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm just going to summarize the main points here and then show you a couple of slides uh, on, on what we've been doing since and, and the kind of work we're doing now in this area. Um, but um, you know, the main points are basically that these dam break type solutions to the nonlinear shallow water equations are very good at describing you know, kind of a classic swash flow generated by a single pulse. Um, and within that flow, the most important scale is that initial shoreline velocity, um, which is also the constant of the characteristics, forward moving characteristics. And that when you look at the friction, really it's only important near the tip here, um, and it does reduce the run-up and probably is what's more important in mobilizing the sediment. Um, and so those are the main sort of three points uh, coming out of that series of studies. Um, I'll show you just some recent extensions. So we started playing with, you know, if you 
So we were looking at swash flows for this uh, classical solitary wave shape, um, but we wanted to see whether the influence of, of the shape of the wave and the volume of the wave uh, would change things because you know, when in real coastal applications, you have different kinds of waves coming in. Um, but this is a nice way to study the, the effects of shape and volume in a, in a clean way, where you can have the same steep phase of the wave and different deceleration phases that have different volumes. Um, and what we found here was that uh, the initial shoreline velocity, um, if you normalize the swash flow with the initial shoreline velocity, as we were doing previously, you collapse all the starting flow of the swash, right? So all the uprush part, the part where the flow is going up. Um, but if you rescale the swash flow with the volume of the fluid in the wave, uh, you nicely collapse the downrush part where the flow is coming back down. And so this suggests that um, what we had previously was not quite the full story, really. There are two important scales. Uh, and one for the for the flow going up and one for the flow coming down and for the flow going up it's the this initial shoreline velocity and may, and the and the volume of the fluid within the wave is what's important for the for the flow coming down um and you can see this uh more clearly again maybe in this case where um you know you have very different wave shapes but these waves all have the same volume and then you go and measure the swash flow and find that actually for the flow coming down uh, all these different waves will generate the same flow coming down. And so really it's the wave volume that, that that's important for this downrush flow. Um, so that's important to know uh, because you might want to, might, that might suggest you, you know, for whatever, uh, say for example, sediment transport applications, there are different scales that you might use to parameterize um, how much sediment is transported for the uprush and then, and then for the downrush. Um, so this is the last slide. This is uh, some current work uh, by a PhD student in my group. Um, and what we're looking at here is now putting the pieces together of uh, interactions in the swash zone. So everything we've done so far has been a single transient pulse uh, and, and studying the swash flow of that. Um, but what you see in the field is often that, you know, the flow from one wave is coming back down and then you have the next bore coming back up. And then at some point suddenly, there's a large sediment suspension event. Um, and so really what's happening here is that the, the swash flow between different wave crests is interacting and producing some kind of, uh, some kind of fluidization event or, or, or something else that we're trying to understand. Um, so, you know, we have a hypothesis of what's going on here uh, in terms of the boundary layer dynamics. And we're starting to do some experiments in our, in our refurbished wave tank. Uh, where we, you know, have different, so this is some ca overhead camera images of a swash interaction. Um, and we're, we've, you know, we think there are these three different stages of the swash interaction that could be important. Uh, the first is when this wave breaks and that jet slams onto some shallow water. The second is where that jet now, you can see the jet tube here will induce a secondary splash up. And the third is where this entire thing <clears throat> um, suddenly becomes fully three-dimensional and turbulent. And, and you know, some, some part of that interaction is going to be important for this uh, sediment suspension. And so we're, we're looking into this process in some experiments in, at Madison. Um, okay, so uh, I think hopefully I haven't gone over time. Um, I'll just acknowledge uh, everyone that I worked with and some funding sources and leave you with some references and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, thank you, Namish. Uh, are there any questions? So, Philip, you could go ahead. Thank you. I am uh, Philippe Audier from uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, but I'm currently visiting in Chennai. Uh, and so, uh, I was wondering, it's a very uh, basic question, but I was told that the beaches here in Chennai were completely reshaped uh, by the 2004 tsunami uh, with uh, becoming much, with much uh, steeper slope that uh, they had initially. Is that something that uh, would be captured in your model or the amplitude is so large that uh, you need a different uh, approach? Um. <clears throat> Uh, it's not fully captured here, um, but I can tell you a little bit about um, how it relates, maybe. Um, so there's been other research uh, looking at trying to predict 
you know, using the kind of sediment transport parameterizations that exist in the literature and trying to predict what happens in this kind of classical uh, flow case. And what you always see is that in, if you try and, you know, whatever sediment transport model you use, in this type of dam break flow, you always predict a net offshore transport of sediment. Um, and when this, you know, not, to, not, not for the problem you, you described, but when, when, when you try and understand beach dynamics in general, this is a big problem because it means that we don't really understand how beaches accrete sediment, uh, how they become, you know, milder sloped and, and build up sediment. Um, and so that's one of, you know, that's what's led us down the hypothesis of looking at this type of situation where you have a sudden suspension event that's now going to carry sediment trans, that's now going to carry sediment onshore and build up the beach. Um, so, so, so that's why we're looking at this. But for the tsunami case, you know, I think, I think what might be happening is you have this type of situation. And so in, you know, in that case, it, I don't know about the local dynamics there, but you may have produced a large, you know, single transient forcing that had this kind of dynamics, and you ended up making the slope much uh, steeper by, by, by a large offshore sediment transport event over the course of, the course of that tsunami. Um, so you have to be a little careful because, you know, the, the tsunami is this extremely long wave that comes and hits the beach, whereas the regular waves are obviously much shorter. Um, but when you zoom in, you know, they may have some similar dynamics uh, like this. So, so yeah, Thank so you. I don't really know, but that's kind of my guess. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. On a... Yeah, Mani, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nimish, uh, for the talk. So in, in the internal waves community when the internal wave in a stratified flow is incident on the shelf break not the shelf but the shelf break they talk about what are called internal wave boluses i i do not know much about them i was just wondering if, if there is a relation between uh, uh, internal wave boluses and uh, what you're talking about here yeah that that's a good question um in my when I was a postdoc, I, I was sharing an office with someone that had worked on a similar problem, uh, but for internal waves. So sorry, I'm just going to go back to the setup here. So this was our surface wave setup, right, for our experiments. Um, for internal waves, you you tend to normally have an internal solitary wave of depression, right? Uh, that's the more common scenario. Um, and so uh, this uh, so so this was some research from Stanford where. They had looked at um, how an internal wave of depression uh, would interact with the slope. And, and so I was curious whether, you know, it would undergo a similar dynamics where the front of the wave steepens and you get this bore-like feature. I think the bolus that you're referring to is almost like this bore-like feature and whether it again drives this dam break type flow um, in, the, in the internal swash. Um, so we, we compared some of, the, some of that data to, to some of this theory and it didn't seem to work too well. And so, so I didn't look into it further at that point, but, but you know, I think there's an interesting question of what the, what the links are between the internal uh, swash dynamics and the surface swash dynamics, yeah. Um, but but you know, the short answer is that we, you know, we had a quick look at, at in a setup that was very similar to this, but for the internal wave case, and, and it didn't seem to apply, uh, you know, analogously. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So, Nimish, if I may ask, uh, when you were describing about the uh, retreating dynamics, uh, depending only on the wave volume, uh, not specifically on the detailed shape. So, I mean, if I'm thinking of more of a wave train that is there, at some point it should start to probably matter, right? The long, the, how much is the uh, horizontal extent over which this wave packet is spread? Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And the important parameter there is this uh, dimensionless time ratio between, yeah, so you're, you're, you're talking of it in terms of length here. Yes. But, but I can also talk about it in terms of this period. Um, and so what, what, what starts to matter is um, what the period of the wave train coming in is, 
relative to the period of the swash cycle. Okay. Uh, and and they're not one to one always. Um, and so so in this study where we had these you know different wave cases, I quantified what that ratio is for these different waves, and you see that at some point it crosses yeah, below um, below one, meaning that the next wave is going to arrive before the full downrush is completed. Yeah. So in that case, um, you don't necessarily expect to be able to predict, um, you know, the full tail of this downrush flow uh, with the volume. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one more question I had was regarding I mean, the, the uh, big picture that you have regarding the sediment transport part, and you addressed this in the end. Uh, so this, in a sense, is actually the coupled problem, right, where the formation of your slope is determined because there is erosion happening offshore transport is happening. So uh, that uh, steep uh, or the uh, slope that you have, that's also evolving. So in some sense, does it actually attain a universal shape that after a point, it doesn't really change much, even though there is a continuous process of erosion and probably deposition happening? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so on a wave by wave time scale, you don't expect the slope to to change uh, so much that that you know this this doesn't work. Um, but on the, on a, on a, on longer time scales, you're absolutely right. Um, there are some models to predict what this equilibrium beach slope and shape will be, but most of them, or or you know, they what they really talk about is the is the offshore part. Sorry, I'm going to go. Back. You know, is is this part? Okay. Um, and you know, the, there's there's some classical. Uh, classical papers on this. So, you know, with, for example, with sea level rise, if the water depth, you know, if the entire depth changes uh, by a small amount, you know, there are some models that will help you predict what this profile will look like. But here, you know, I guess the dynamics are fundamentally different in the swash because of this collapse process. So you no longer have oscillatory motion. And here the slope locally can be different and and so here there are no good models to predict the kind of thing you're talking about um and and the issue is that you know this region is really active in terms of sediment transport you know i forget the numbers now but you know sometimes an order of magnitude more sediment gets moved per unit time here than than it does here um and so so that's why you know a lot of the research now is focused in this in this area yeah yeah so this is called the brun rule if you want to yeah Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, then thank you, Nimish, once again. I know it's very early in the morning for you. So thanks for taking all the time to speak to us. Yeah, no, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, seems like a, a exciting time at IIT uh, Chennai with the, with the initiative, so yeah. Yeah, That's and it will be nice when you visit uh, next time, if you could. I have come down here in person and that would have been, we would be happy to host you then. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Okay. Okay. See you. Great. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.